All right. We are live, audio and video is recording. Welcome to the last lecture of Engineering 213. You know, it's, you know you'd go in, you know, we were in person, you'd go and say, hey, welcome to the last lecture. Everybody starts clapping. You're like, well, I, I didn't think you'd be so happy that the class is over. It's like, I, I see how you feel. Uh, I, I'm just kidding. Um, okay, so uh, let's get the logistics real quick out of the way. So all the homeworks are graded. All the attendance grades are posted, obviously, up until, the, you know, today. Um, you have the at-home game. And I looked on um, Blackboard and on Course Eval, and most of you had completed everything. The one thing that was worth mentioning is that there were a couple of you that had not uploaded the, the screen captures. So the way that the, the surveys work, I know um, how many completed the survey. But unless I get like a 100% response rate, then I don't know who did it. Uh, that's why you, you, we do the uploads. Um, I emailed everybody in the class a, um, uh, uh, that, that I didn't see uploads for. I sent everybody an email and said, here's the links. And I've heard back from some of you. Uh, th this uh, completion rate was uh, at around like 11 o'clock today. So I think already this, this info is out of date. I think we've already had a few more do the course eval uh, and, and what have you. So um, if you haven't do, uh, done that, please do so. It really does help out with the assessment. Um, and, and, you know, we were joking around at the beginning of class about, you know, how this is the, I guess you all have are my favorite statics class I've ever taught because I, I've only ever taught it once. This is my first time teaching it. So um, there's always room to improve. There's always uh, uh, things that can go better. So um, I do really uh, appreciate the feedback. If there's any comments that you have, I mean, I mean, let me know. I mean, I've, I was looking at the CL over uh, survey and there's already some really good feedback there. Um, so again, the, the, the feedback helps. Um, I said I wasn't going to have any uh, 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 real slides today that I was going to just, you know, open it up to questions. I did think of something that was worth putting in the presentation, uh, and that was, I went through the, the three exams that we had. So if you remember on Blackboard or on Microsoft Teams, I went and uh, after the exams were graded, I posted those little videos where I went through the statistics and I had some suggestions for future exams. And I thought, well, heck, you know, that, like this final's comprehensive. Let's just throw all those suggestions here together. And, and like I said, they're suggestions. They're not like stuff you have to do, but it's just um, stuff I wanted to bring up. And some of it, like, uh, you know, you've, you've already uh, uh, accounted for in other exams. So like, for instance, um, uh, on uh, uh, exam one, you know, like one of the comments I had was that time management is key, but also focus on the problem weights because we had some really, really long answers for the problems that were only worth a couple points. So make sure that, you know, you're focusing on the... Um, the problem uh, waits, you know, give as much time uh, uh, as is necessary for a given problem. Uh, don't use the equation toolboxes in Blackboard to answer the questions. Like uh, just, you know, some of you use like the little thing where you, you build the equation and you could just, you know, write like X equals two and that's fine. You don't need to build an equation and it, it probably took extra time to do it. Uh, and you can just, you know, verbally write that stuff out. Uh, make sure that you always answer every question and show as much work as you can. Like the more you give me to go off of in terms of grading, the, the more partial credit I can assign. And it's not like me just trying to give you points. Like I'm, I'm not, you know, just, just handing points out. But um, what I do is if we have a 20 point problem, I'll look at your work and then, you know, I award points based on, you know, how close I were or how close I think you were to the, to the, uh, to the answer. And if you, there's not much there, then there's not much I have to go off of. So the more I have to go off of, the easier it is for me to grade. Um, always, uh, uh, you know, when you're assessing a problem, don't make it more complex than it already is. And some of the approaches on the past few exams, like you have a problem and, and, and you make it out to be harder than it needs to be. And one of the reasons that that happens is because, you know, uh, uh, like don't, don't, um, don't use shortcuts. And I actually mentioned this in another class, like, uh, you know, if you're doing, uh, let's say it's a, a truss analysis, like you're doing method of joints, like draw the pictures out, draw the image or the figures out, draw the joints out, 
uh, and label it. And by by drawing it out, by actually taking the steps necessary to draw the lines and the splitting the diagonals into horizontals and verticals, it actually reduces errors and it actually goes faster than if you try and skip a bunch of steps. Like you end up introducing errors and then you're trying to, you know, it, it's like a, a dog chasing its tail and, and, you know, next thing you know, time's up, you know, so uh, make sure that you're, you're, you're following through. Make sure you read the questions and answer the questions. So I'm the short answers on a couple of the exams, it was, you know, why is, you know, what, you know, what method would you choose this or this, and then explain your reasoning. And then I'd have, you know, people choose, but they wouldn't explain the reasoning. Um, and then again, going into this, use the figures and diagrams. And then I had one other suggestion in regard to trig, like try and avoid the trig functions. So, you know, for instance, if you have a load at an angle and you have the slope ratio, you can just use Sakatoa to split it up into X and Y components. You don't need to you know, compute the angle by finding the inverse tangent and then taking the sine and cosine of that angle. It's just more steps. Uh, at least I think it's more steps. Um, and it makes, in, in my opinion, it's also not as intuitive. But I'm not telling that you have to avoid them. You know, in the end, what matters is that it's correct. The last thing I am is a professor that says you must do it my way. I mean, I want you to get the right answer. And, you know, everybody comes uh, to the table with a different you know, math background, you went to different schools and had different teachers in high school and college and whatnot. So whatever, uh, m you know, methods that you think are, are, are comfortable for you are what matter. But make sure that you're not using more steps than is necessary. If I can solve the problem in five steps and you take 12 steps, those 12 steps, that's just more potential for error. So, okay, I'm done. Uh, questions, the floor is yours. Am I getting off easy? I'll give everybody a minute to let every, everything soak in. Oh, I'm getting off easy. There's got to be some questions out there. Can we review one of the... All right, hold, hold on. Okay, it's been... <laughs> okay. All right, um, we got a few questions all at once. So can we review one of the advanced tension problems? Um, before I get to that, I might need you to um, give me an example of what you mean by that, because I, I don't know what you mean by advanced tension. But in response to Mr. Morris's question, tell me one more time how it'll be set up. So the, the logistics are going to be the exact same as the previous exam, just a little bit longer. Let me tell you what, let me do something. I'll do you one better. Let me give me a second. While I'm doing this, Mr. Page, if you can give me some clarification on what you're talking about, I can I can do that. But give me a sec. Um, this is uploading, so it might take a second. All right, hold, hold on. Let me see if I can digest that, Mr. Page. But let me go back to um, uh, to Mr. Morris's question. So the slide that I think you're probably looking for is this one. So the exam's going to open on 1240, at 12.45 p.m. on Friday, ne next Friday, and it's going to close at 2.45 p.m. on, on Friday. Um, uh, it's designed to be 100 minutes long, but you've got two hours to do it. Um, so, uh, 
you know, just like the last exams, like the exams one through three, like they were designed to be 50 minutes long, but I gave you an hour to do them. So this one's designed to be 100 minutes long, but I'm giving you two hours to do it. That's the university time slot that we drew for Monday, Wednesday, Friday classes at, at, at one o'clock. Um, the, the PDF upload form will close at four, um, but, you know, I just, usually I would close it an hour after, but I say, let's just, let's just make it at four. Um, the, uh, operation again, it's like, it's a forced completion. You have to complete it in one sitting. It's 120 minutes, um, uh, time limit and it'll automatically save and submit. So make sure that you have your answers in, uh, in that time slot. Um, the, uh, questions will appear all at once. Um, you can use any of the notes on Blackboard, the, your book, your notes, uh, the lecture notes, the recordings, the homework solutions, the homework assignments, you just can't use uh, another individual. Um, and then it'll probably be something like eight to 10 short answer questions. And I haven't finalized the number of computational problems, but I'm thinking five. I'm thinking five computational problems uh, to close us out. Now, um, while that, while you're chewing on that to see if that answers your question, I'm going back to Mr. Page's comment, and I'll admit I'm I'm still a little lost. Like um, I I I don't I don't know which problem you're talking about. <laughs> Do you have like a homework assignment you're referring to, or like an, a a lecture? Because like I I don't know. Okay. All right. That okay. That is that. I think that's probably a good one to look at. Uh, give me a second. Um. Yeah. Is 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 that what you meant? Like a. I don't, when you say tension though, I don't, I don't know what you mean by, are you talking about like a truss or a, a shear and moment diagram? Are you talking about reactions? Like, hold on, let me, let me. Okay, hold, hold on, Let, let's, give me, a, give me a sec. Okay. All right. I, I, I think I kind of know what you're talking about now, like from the discussion, but <laughs> it's fine. Here, here's what I'm going to do. I've got two problems that I think are worth just looking at. And I think that these might go along because there's the, the balloon problem, which was, uh, I think a really good one. And then there's the, um, equivalent force system problem where you take a bunch of forces and you idealize them as a single force in a single moment. And both of those problems involve the, the necessary skills going into computing reactions. And I think they'd be really good to look at. So I'm going to look at those uh, if it's all right. And I think that they'll, um, that they'll, uh, satisfy that concern. And if not, like, like, let me know. Okay. So, okay. All right. Good, good. Let's look at both of these then. Okay. So let's start off with the, um, the balloon problem. Okay. And so let this, you're, as, as somebody said in chat, it's been a minute or, uh, as, as I think it was Mr. Page said, it has been a while since we've looked at this. So let's, let's take a look at the balloon problem first. So first off, let's classify the problem. This was a particle statics problem. The reason why we call this particle statics is because all of the forces we're assuming all meet through a common point. So if you look at this little set of arrows next or to the left of the balloon, the force of the balloon, the balloon is exerting a vertical force of a magnitude of 800 newtons. So it's acting 800 newtons up in the y direction. So the vector would be 800 j. Um, there are three ropes anchoring this balloon to the ground, 
and they're all sort of you know uh, oriented at different directions. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to uh, identify some vectors to um, to define those those cables. And so we we use the distance vector approach first. So we say you know if I go from point A to point B, what is that vector? So it's negative 4.2 in the uh, x direction, it's negative 5.6 in the j direction, and it's zero, uh, or, sorry, negative 4.2 in the x, negative 5.6 in the y, and zero in the z. So it's negative 4.2 i, negative 5.6 j, and zero k. Notice how all the vectors, the a, b, a, c, a, d, they all have negative 5.6 in the j direction because the balloon is 5.6 meters off the ground. That's why all the vectors have a negative 5.6 on the J because J is uh, uh, associated with Y. The Y is, you know, according to this uh, uh, coordinate system, Y is, is from the ground up. Uh, and so all the ropes go down. Um, now, in order to represent a force as a vector, remember like one of the fundamental formulas that we use is we said that, okay, a force is just a magnitude at times a direction. So the magnitude of the force is really what we're solving for. We're trying to determine the magnitude of the tension in those three cables. I just said tension. Now, now I get what you were talking about because you said tension. <laughs> um, so we're trying to determine the magnitude of the tension in those three cables. So the magnitudes are the unknowns, but the directions we can figure out because we take the distance vectors divide them each by their magnitude, right? So you determine the magnitude by just using the Pythagorean theorem in three dimensions, and then you can determine the um, a unit vector by just taking each of those vectors and dividing them by their magnitude. So the unit vectors are unitless. They don't have meters in them. And it's just, you know, like negative 0.6i, negative point, uh, or negative 0.6i, negative 0.8j, and 0k, and uh, so on and so forth. And so we have these three unknown, uh, um, or these three unit vectors, multiplying them by their magnitudes, now we have the, the, uh, the force vectors for each of the cables, as well as F sub B at the bottom. F sub B at the bottom is the, uh, the force from the balloon acting upward. So notice how if you look at the three cables, the J components are negative, but for the balloon, the J component is positive because because so you can sort of think the balloon is floating upwards, so the cables are anchoring it downwards. So um, the reason why I like to write it in this fashion is you know I'm spacing everything out, but I can add up all the I components, add up all the J components, add up all the K components, and there's my sum of forces in the X direction, sum of forces in the Y direction, sum of forces in the Z direction. And so once I have them written in that, uh, in that you know, tabular uh, fashion, you know, I just take those three equations and write them in a matrix form, right? And now that I've got them in matrix form, I can plug them into my handy dandy Casio FX uh, 115 ES plus, you know, uh, and there we go. There's the three tensions uh, in the cables. And so, you know, what's your process? So for your unknowns, write a distance vector then write a unit vector for each of those distance vectors, then multiply them by their unknown magnitudes and just use your three equations of equilibrium, collect your like terms, plug it into the Casio. And that's pretty much it, you know. Uh, the Casio doesn't know what you're labeling, like it's just gonna report X, Y, and Z. So when you plug it into your Casio, you, you need proper bookkeeping to ensure that your, um, you know, like, okay, all the terms associated with TAB are collected together. All the terms associated with TAC are collected together. All the terms associated with TAD are collected together. And so when it says X, you know, X is the first solution, so that corresponds to the TAB. Y is the second solution, so it corresponds to the TAC. And Z is the third solution, uh, so on and so forth. Um, so that would be a, a particle statics problem, and that's like a a beautiful example of an exam one problem. So let me sort of let that stew and, and marinate for a second. Does anybody have any questions about this example? And then maybe what I'll do is I'll pull up one of the equivalent force system examples, because I think the equivalent force system examples definitely exercise the moment uh, uh, muscles, if you will. This is definitely an exercise of the force and vector muscles.
Any questions on this example? Well, all right. no, all right. wait, 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 wait. Okay, we're talking about two different things here. So, um, then, okay, so when you write this in matrix form here, the goal is to solve the, the, the system. And so in order to solve this system, what you would need to do is find the inverse of this matrix. Now, finding the inverse of a three by three is not impossible to do by hand, but it is a, a, a fairly lengthy process, and that's why you need the calculator. The rule of Saris is for something different. The rule of Saris is for determining determinants, okay? So the rule of Saris would be if you had um, a three by three uh, 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 matrix and you were trying to find the determinant of that matrix. Um, the, and that's, you know, uh, that's not something like, I mean, yeah, you would, I mean, definitely you would need to do that on the exam uh, if you're trying to determine a cross product, but we wouldn't use the rule of Saris to determine the inverse of a matrix. The rule of Saris is, is used to determine the determinant of a matrix. And the only time we really use that in here is when we were evaluating cross products. But remember, there's two ways to do a cross product. You can use the rule of Saris or you can use the cofactor expansion method that we discussed uh, 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 right after the first exam. Does that make sense? I guess I'm asking if I end up with a three by three matrix. All right, well, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, we're, 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 we're mixing up some stuff here. Okay. All right, hold hold on. We're 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 mixing up some stuff here. All right, so let let's let's make sure we're 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 speaking the same language. Okay, so um, in this context for this problem, okay, what we've got is we have a, a square matrix. That's true, but what we're trying to do is solve a system of equations. Me writing it in this fashion is just shorthand term for representing those three equations, equations one, two, and three as three equations, three unknowns. These are a system of equations, okay? In that context, you need to solve this system. You do not use the rule of Saris to solve a system of equations, okay? To solve the system of equations, you'd either go back to algebra and use elimination, use substitution. You could try and find the inverse of that matrix. What I'm saying is that for a system that's two by two, you could do that by hand. You know, uh, when I'm talking about um, uh, 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 substitution and, and, and elimination, like if you go back to, to my camera, I'm talking about a problem like this, like 2x plus y equals three, and then like x minus four y equals seven. You know, this is a two equation, two unknown problem. And so you could represent that in, in matrix form. You can, you all can just flip over to, to, my, to my camera to see this. And so with this, you would take the inverse of this matrix, multiply it by that and give you, uh, it'll give you x and y. That's what your Casio does for you. Your Casio will do this for a two by two system or a three by three system. In no way, shape or form will you need to deal with anything larger than a two by two or a three by three on this exam. And that's 
not really me like making it easy on you. That's just physics. We live in a 3D world, you know, X, Y, and Z. So uh, a, a, a three-dimensional problem is really as big as it's going to get, and that's what your Casio can handle, uh, no problem. Now, so what we're talking about here is solving a system of equations. The rule of Ceres is not used to solve the system. The rule of Ceres is only used to do one thing, and that's to take the determinant of this matrix, okay? The determinant of that matrix is just a, 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 a special number that, that characterizes the matrix. We never really used the rule of Ceres to compute the determinant of a matrix. We used the rule of Ceres to compute the, the cross product of two vectors. So I think you're, you may be like mixing the two things up, but am, am I? Okay, all right, all right, all right. Yeah, the rule of Ceres is just for cross products. Yeah, it's not for this. All right, any other questions about this problem? Because I'll go ahead and pull up the equivalent system problem if that's all right. Now, it doesn't, do you all want me to do a 2D problem or a 3D problem? It doesn't matter to me. Three D. Okay. All right. So here's a, a the three D example that we did. Um, whenever you're doing an equivalent system problem, ultimately what you're doing is this right here on on the top corner. You're trying to sum forces and sum moments. That's all you're doing. Now, let's let's make sure that we're crystal clear on this. Okay. Um, an equivalent system problem is trying to sum the forces and sum the moments. A reactions problem or an equilibrium problem is summing forces and moments, setting them equal to zero, and then solving for the reactions required to keep the system in equilibrium. Okay, so there's a difference between an equivalent systems problem and an equilibrium problem. In equivalent systems, you're just summing the forces and just summing the moments. In an equilibrium problem, you're summing the forces, setting it equal to zero, summing the moment, setting it equal to zero, okay? And, and the reason is because there's, there's different goals, okay? With an equilibrium problem, you're trying to determine, okay, I've got a beam or a truss and there's a bunch of forces on it. What are the external forces required to keep the system in equilibrium, okay? So, for example, Let's take my office. My office has got a bunch of stuff in it. It's got me, it's got my desk, my microwave, my coffee pot, my, my fridge, my bookshelf. There's a bunch of stuff in my office, okay? So to, to put this in a real world context, an equivalent systems problem related to my office would be, let's take all these forces and lump them into just a single force and a single moment. Represent all the loads in my office with just a single vector, okay? An equilibrium problem is then, okay, Dr. Mike's office has got all these loads in it. How much does the floor need to be able to support? What's the reaction force to make sure that Dr. Mike and his office doesn't fall, uh, the stuff in his office doesn't fall through the floor? So those are the differences. So in this, we're just collecting them. So that's why you won't see a sum of forces equals zero or a sum of moments equals zero. Now, um, for this problem, there were three different forces, okay? Um, the first thing that we did in this problem is uh, we got these three different forces and you have to take those forces and write them as vectors and then write the position vectors. So let's start off with the forces. Okay, so there's a force at B, a force at C, and a force at D. So let's take the force at B. We know that the magnitude of that force is 700 newtons and we can determine the, the, the vector you know, so how, how, you know, this is the same process that we would do before. How do you determine a force? It's a magnitude times a, a, a unit vector. So determine the vector from B to E, divide by its magnitude to get a unit vector from B to E, and then multiply that vector times 700 to get 
F sub B. So that's where that 300I minus 600J plus 200K comes from. Same thing with the force at C, same thing with the uh, force at D. So you got these three different forces, add up those forces to get a single resultant force vector. Boom, there's your, there's your resultant force vector. You just add up all the forces. Now what about the moment vector? Well, I take each of those, each of those um, uh, forces and I multiply them by their moment arm. So what do I mean by multiply? This is a moment, a moment is a vector, so that means a vector product. So we do R cross F, we do a vector cross product, okay? So we take each of those forces and we multiply them by their moment arm. What do I mean by moment arm? Moment arm is the distance from the point in question, right, to the force, right? And so for each of these, we're measuring those vectors from A, right? So from A to B, from A to C, from A to D, right? So those R vectors are pointing from A to each of those three points. So from A to B, from A to C, from A to D. Now, position vectors are not unit vectors. They are just raw distances, okay? The reason why is because, you know, the definition of a force is a, or a definition of a moment is a force times a moment arm. You wouldn't take those moment arms and divide out the magnitude. You need the magnitude because the farther the force away is from the point, the larger the moment. So you do not divide those vectors by their magnitude to get a unit vector. You leave it uh, as such. So we have the force vectors, we have the position vectors, and we just do R cross F for each of those. Now you can do that however you want. Um, uh, however you want to do those uh, determinants, as we were talking about earlier, you can use the rule of Saris or you can use cofactor expansion. It's whichever you want to do, whichever you feel more comfortable with. I actually kind of prefer cofactor expansion, like personally when I do it, but you might like the rule of Saris. It, it, it really doesn't matter. It's because it'll give you the same answer. Um, but when you have those three uh, 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 forces and you multiply them, uh, you know, perform cross products with their respective position vectors, you get the three underlying vectors you see here. This is the one for B, this is the one for C, this is the one for D. So add all those up and here's what you get. So this is my resultant force vector and this is my resultant moment vector. So the idea is that I can replace a bunch of different forces on a system with just two vectors, a single force vector and a single moment vector. And so how do you get the force vector? You just add up all the forces. And how do you get the moment vector? You add up all the cross products of the forces. So R is the sum of the Fs. M is the sum of the R cross Fs. And that's an equivalent systems problem. There's another um, equivalent systems problem. Like we did two examples. And the second example, was was basically the same thing. This one was a little easier to conceptualize because all of the forces were all pointing along the y direction. So they were all like negative j forces, uh, but it was still the same process. Each, uh, each of those four forces had an f vector and it had an r vector, okay? So we were taking moments at the origin, right? So we needed, you know, an f for each vector, or F for each force and an F vector and an R vector for each force. For the first one, the R vector was zero because we were taking moments at the origin and the first force was at the origin. So it generated no moment. Um, the rest, however, do generate moments. So you just do R cross F for each of those. Do, you know, have your F vector, add up the R's, add up the M's. Boom. There you go. And that's basically it. So, I'm going to let that stew and, and marinate for a bit and see if anybody has any questions on that. <laughs> yeah, it is lunchtime, or, or I guess it was lunchtime.
Nah. Well, I'm, I'm drinking my coffee, so. One thing I will make sure that everybody's you know, uh, clear on is that everybody in the class can access the class notebook, right? If you have Microsoft Teams installed on your computer, you can go to the team for the class and then on the top bar, there's class notebook. So, um, you know, if we go to engineering 213 and then go to class notebook, yeah, all those are right there. Oh, wait, hold on. Give me a sec here. I'll give me a sec. Let me stop and share. So this is the Teams interface for the class. I have mine in dark mode because it's a little easier on my eyes. And if you go to class notebook, you should be able to access the notes on your own. Um, if you go to, like my interface probably looks a tad different, but what you're looking for is the content library. If you go to this content library and then this first link, here's all the problems for, for the class. And so like, here's one, I think we talked about this one earlier. And boom, these are the, um, these are some of the examples. But yeah, all those, I did them in teams so that everybody would have access to them. I hope everybody knew that. Let me see something. Yeah, I, I posted a comment on that, but I thought I'd refresh everybody so you knew. We still have a few, uh, a little bit of time, so I mean, if there are any other questions, please let me know. I was going to say, I do have a couple other logistical items to discuss before the, um, uh, before the semester closes, but, um, uh, but, but we, again, we do still have plenty of time. Am I getting off easy? Oh, there's got to be some questions out there. <laughs> um, there, it's just an, if you click the, um, the, uh, there's a little picture in the top right corner. And if you click that picture and I think you can click settings, uh, it changes it from there. So if you log into your teams, um, here, I'll show you.
So I'll give everybody a sec on this. So yeah, this this saved me on, on my eyesight a little bit. And I'll, I'll actually I'm going to mention one other software program I downloaded recently that I do want to share with the class. This is actually pretty slick. Um, uh, in case you're interested. But um, if you look right here on the very top, there's like a little picture. For some reason, mine isn't popping up. I don't know why. But uh, if you go to settings under the picture, that's where you can change the mode from uh, to dark mode. And one other thing I do want to point out, um, uh, or... And, and this is a free app, and, and maybe it's more for the Windows users, but I'll show you something that, that I've actually very recently downloaded that's helped me out a bit. Um, uh, this is a, uh, an app that I downloaded uh, recently called F.LUX, uh, and I think if you Google it, it's pretty easy to find. But what this basically is, how many of you use the blue light filter on your phone? Or uh, if you know what I'm talking about, it filters out uh, the blue light uh, and it makes the phone a little easier on your eyes. Well, Windows has a native blue light filter, but it's kind of hard to find and it's not as user friendly. Um, F.Lux is a, uh, it's an app that you can download that um, what it does is it actually uses the, um, the, sun up and sun down, like the sunrise and the sunset time in your latitude longitude. And it adjusts the blue light filter on your computer based on the, um, uh, based on where you're at. And so right now it's not really doing very much blue light filtering because it's the middle of the day, but as it gets darker, it, it'll, uh, it can, um, it can do that. Let me see what it'll do here. Oh, it's, it's not doing anything for you, but for me, oh man, it just went like, uh, it went very, very orange for me just now um, uh, and whatnot. But yeah, it'll, as as the day gets darker, it'll it'll adjust the blue light filter and it really has helped out. So, and, and the only reason I recommend that is because I don't know about y'all, but I've been spending a lot of time on that computer these days. <laughs> so, uh Maybe you Mac users, maybe there's like a, a a native feature. I think that you can download that for Mac as well. I'm I'm not a Mac user, but um, I, f I found it, it it's helped out a lot. Yeah, it, it's it's kind of it, it's 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 a very very simple program, but it's got a lot of features. Um, and and for its versatility and the fact that it's free, I thought it was it was pretty slick. Um, any other questions before we uh, before we call it? I do have a couple logistical items I want to discuss before we call it, though. Okay, I'm, I'm not seeing a whole lot in the way of questions. So let me say a couple other things. The first thing uh, I want to talk about is the uh, the course evals and the CLO surveys. Uh, again, I sent everybody an email that I didn't get a, a survey response for. So again, please uh, fill that out. It really does help out a lot uh, with the course development, helps out with the assessment um, that and, and free homework points. So, so yeah, it, it really does help. Um, the Again, the exam uh, is It'll operate like all the others. Uh, it'll open up 12:45 on uh, Friday. I'll be there, like I'll be, you know, like here live. And if there's any questions with the the, the tech or whatnot, I'll I'll be there to sort of work it out. Um, uh, so make sure you know, don't don't forget that. But if you got any questions, I'll I'll be available. Um, I do have one other sort of, you know, I guess final parting message I want to say before we close out the class. Um, uh, oh, <laughs> I'm going to do that later today. I, I was going to grade them all at once, uh, but yeah, it, uh, it, it actually does raise the, the grade here a, a little bit. Not a, like a lot, but it, but it does help a little bit. Um, the one thing I do want to say, though, before we close this out is um, 
this has been, I know, uh, a very challenging semester for, for everybody here. I mean, it's been challenging for me too. Um, but I, and I hope this doesn't come across as, as sappy. It's not, it's not intended to be, it's really intended to, to be a, a genuine message. I am very proud of all of you. Um, this has been difficult, I know, and, and statics, I'm sure that, that many of you uh, uh, heard, if you uh, have, have friends who've taken statics or you have, uh, I don't know, uh, elders or, or family members that are engineers, you know, there's statics is always considered uh, that, that, uh, that weed out, make or break class a lot of times in engineering programs. And I know that this is not what uh, a lot of folks signed up for, you know, um, the, the pandemic sort of hit us, you know, all at once and, uh, uh, we're all, we're all, you know, making it, uh, uh, and, and, and some instances making it up as we go. Um, but I gotta say, I'm, I've been just like, like stunned at, at how, how well you've done. Um, and I say that with the, the honest reflection that, I don't know that I could have performed as well as you did if I were in your shoes. I mean, I, I took a couple online classes when I was in college, um, but it wasn't anything like this. And uh, I know that this has been stressful. I know that, um, you know, on top of just the college experience, I mean, life certainly has probably been pretty stressful the, these past few months. Um, and, and I'm really just stunned at, at, at how well you've done. I really am proud of you. Uh, you you've definitely um, uh, accomplished something. I mean, uh, uh, I can say with, with absolute certainty that, um, you know, an engineering firm, a, a DOH, uh, you know, Army Corps, whatnot, they're going to be lucky to have you all uh, when you get out of here because, you know, you, you've you've definitely shown a maturity way above and beyond your years. And I mean, I know, I don't, I, I meant what I said. I don't know how I would have handled it if I was in your shoes. And um, so I'm, I'm really proud of you. Uh, I am here if you need me. Uh, for you civils, you will have me again, I guarantee it, because uh, uh, you know I'm, I'm the structures guy, so you'll you'll have me for your structural analysis and and hopefully some you know structural design courses later. If you're not a, a civil, if you're a mechanical, there's um, there's a chance this might be the last time uh, that uh, that that we uh, that I have you for class. But let me just say that the proverbial door is always open. Um, I know nobody's on campus right now, uh, but if you need anything uh, in the future or just want to stop by and see how things are uh, going, my, my door's always open. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, stay in touch. Uh, and with that, I guess uh, I'll sign off. Uh, again, um, uh, you all done very well. I hope everybody, uh, uh, you know, I, I wish you best of luck on your finals, and, and I hope everybody has a relaxing break. Um, do me a favor, and I've told this to all my classes, take take the break. I mean, you know, we've got a, a long uh, winter break coming up, you know, because of our adjusted calendar, the winter break's longer than it, than it normally or it has been in previous years. So I really do hope that you get some rest and relaxation in uh, and, and that you're able to, to recharge and, and, and fire it up for the spring semester. Uh, and that's all I have, everybody. Uh, if you need anything, again, let me know. Best of luck on the final, and uh, we will see you. Um, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and and uh, I, I hope you, uh, that everybody's enjoyed statics. I hope you, you've taken something out of it. This is a really important topic in engineering, and so I, I, I really you know, take it seriously, and I, I don't want to make sure that you, you've gotten your money's worth. Um, and so that's all I have. Uh, I will see you all next week. Best of luck on your finals. And, and I, I wish everybody a wonderful break. That's all I have. We will see you all. Uh, or I'll see some of you, uh, you know, in, in future semesters. So that's all I got, everybody. We'll see you. Thank you. Thank you.